Today's show is brought to you by Audible, and right now you can get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com forward slash joined up. There's over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle or MP3 player. Thanks for tuning in to the Joined Up Writing Podcast, a weekly show featuring interviews with fantastic authors sharing their personal stories on how and why they write. There's hints and tips for aspiring writers and great book reviews from top bloggers. Follow us on Twitter at JU Podcast. Right, cue the cheesy theme tune. Put down your pen and stop your typing. Grab yourself a drink cause it's joined up writing. Happy New Year and welcome to the Joined Up Writing Podcast where a little procrastination can go a long way. I'm Wayne Kelly and it's the first show in 2019 and episode 95 with Karin Salvalaggio, author of the Macy Greeley Mystery Series. Karin has a really interesting background and some practical tips based on her own writing process as well. I'll also be taking a short break later in the show to give a shout out to a load of listeners who got in touch over the past few weeks, both with their feedback on the show, guest suggestions and to tell me about their own writing plans for the coming year. On that subject, I've had lots of time for reflection over the festive break. Uh, To be honest, I've done zero actual writing and that's something I've got pretty mixed feelings about. On the one hand, I had big plans for my time off. I wanted to do something on the new novel, edit a script I'm producing in a couple of months and get my head back into the non-fiction project I'm collaborating on with Maria Smith. What have I actually done? Well, I've watched loads of TV, films, enjoyed time with my family, played video games, cheered on my football team, read some books and, of course, eaten several times my own body weight in chocolate. And as I record this, it's the 2nd of January and I can feel the inevitable January blues banging on my door asking to take up residence until spring or whatever, you know, whenever that turns up in a few months from now. So why do we do this to ourselves? Does anybody else out there give themselves a huge to-do list for their holiday time and then feel down when they don't achieve it? Um, Or, you know, am I the only one who feels like this? Surely not. Why do we find it so difficult to give ourselves permission to relax? I think it's particularly true of those who fit in writing around our day jobs because when we're busy at work we complain that finding time and headspace to write is so difficult. Then we get a few days off and we struggle to get motivated or to focus and I tend to find I just want to zone out for a while, unplug from social media and work emails and everything else and just recharge my batteries. And is that so bad? I don't think so, but I still can't help giving myself a hard time about it. But the reason I'm talking about it now is twofold. Firstly, I want to tell anyone out there listening that if they're having similar feelings, that they're not alone. And secondly, having recognised it and said it out loud, I now want to try to vanquish all those bad feelings and look at, you know, these times in a more positive light. Because as creative, sometimes it's okay to spend the holidays not creating stuff and to remember that all the other things in our life, our families, our home life, hobbies, interests and consuming all that other culture, whether that's trash TV or uh, high art, all those things fuel our creativity. And it doesn't matter whether you're writing fantasy, sci-fi, romance, crime, all of those stories will feature relationships and personal interactions and they'll refer to popular culture or deal with wider themes and how can we hope to write convincingly and passionately about those things if we don't take some time to be present in the world and actually live our lives so whatever you're creating I think your work will be richer for the time we spend away from the page so why do we beat ourselves up about it because we're writers and it feels weird to go a few days or weeks without some kind of self-doubt or recrimination I suppose but let's put an end to that right now Turn our minds back to the job in hand and remember that the real reason behind doing all of this is for the fun, enjoyment and the fulfilment we get from creating something out of nothing. Right, sorry about that. Blame the new year on such an out-of-character philosophical rant or maybe it was just a dodgy mince pie. 
Either way, let's continue those positive vibes and get to today's interview with Karin Salvalagio. So Karin was born in West Virginia and has fond memories of her nomadic childhood as part of a military family. She's lived everywhere from Alaska and Florida to California and Iran and now lives in London since 1994. Bone Dust White was her first full-length novel and began the Macy Greeley mystery series, the most recent of which is Silent Rain. She's currently putting the finishing touches to a new standalone novel, which we mentioned in the interview. So enjoy the chat. Apologies for my nasally voice in the chat. It was uh, when I had a cold a few weeks ago. And don't forget, I'll be popping up again later with a few listener mentions. Okay, Corin, thanks for joining me on Joined Up Writing. Really appreciate it. Um, so how's things? I understand you've been socialising. It's that time of the year. So how's everything going with you? It's been fantastic. Um, I was on uh, a blind date. I think it's the first time in First Monday crime history that they had an author blind date. So there were five authors lined up and we were interviewed Um uh, supposedly unseen and about our characters in the book and, you know, w- trying to sell our book and which this buyer would buy. Um, so that was quite fun. Oh, that so that was good. Yeah. Yeah, that was Monday night. So, yeah, it was a fun evening and I, I sold some books, which was nice too. That's always a bonus. Well on, well, on the subject of that, why don't you start off by telling us about your Macy Greeley mystery series, of which I think there are now four books. Is that right? Yes, that is correct. Um, the, the mystery series is set in the Flathead Valley in Montana, which is the south, if you can imagine, the southwest, south, no, northwest corner of Montana, mm-hmm. r- tucked up right up against the um, Canadian border. It's stunning, absolutely stunning landscape. You've got Glacier National Park. You've got the Flathead Valley going south to a town called Whitehorse. And... The I'd like to think that the landscape itself is another character in the book. It's unavoidable. You know, Montana uh, serves up some incredible weather. And the first book is set in deepest, darkest winter. Um, really great. Sort of, it was a sort of, I was thinking it was a cross between Fargo and Twin Peaks, you know. Right, yeah. I wanted that small, rural town. I wanted a community that was quite insular. And I, you know, that... But, you know, stasis can no longer be maintained. And there's this inciting incident that puts, you know, everything in motion. You know, there's that ripple that comes in the aftermath of a crime. So um, Macy is a special investigator who works for the state Mm -hmm. because uh, Montana is quite rural and there's a lot of small towns and they can't. They don't have the services to provide if some serious crime, which thankfully is rather rare in Montana, takes place. And then they have special investigators that will travel and help local law enforcement um, with any sort of uh, more serious crimes. So that's what Macy does, which makes it interesting because she can move around the state a bit. So you can get some variety in there. Yeah, and the first three books are set in this very remote area called the Flathead Valley. And though the towns are fictitious, they're based very much on the demographics and the geography of the area and what you would expect from towns within that valley. So a lot of people who are local to that area, they're always trying to guess which towns which I'd actually good. based it on, yeah. which is fun. It's yeah. really fun. Yeah. And you like to keep and, a bit of mystery. Yeah. Going. And so um, she is um, in the first book, uh, heavily pregnant and she's sent up to Collier because a woman um, has been found uh, stabbed to death. And it, it, it and it, um, the only witness to the crime was actually her estranged daughter. They haven't seen each other in, I think, oh my God, it's been so long since I wrote this book. I think 11 or 12 years. Mm -hmm. And her daughter, Grace, is quite an isolated young man. I was thinking, a young woman. I was thinking of um, Mary Cat Blackwell from We've Always Lived in the Castle, Shirley Jackson's Mm -hmm. seminal book that was written in 1965, which has been a huge influence on my writing. Mm -hmm. Um, So that sort of 
otherworldly feel to her and she's not she's viewed as an outsider even though she very much grew up in the town so she witnesses this murder but can't identify the killer or doesn't want to identify the killer that's something macy has to figure out so macy comes into this town with a lot of ongoing feuds between families between generations of families um and she's trying to sort out what is really going on with the help of the local sheriff named Warren and a paramedic she used to date. So, so when you um, when you came up with this, so I orig- my original understanding of it is that for a start, you weren't even sure or you didn't actually realize that Macy was going to be the kind of main voice of the book. Is that right? How did that sort of develop? That's absolutely true. Uh, originally, it was sort of uh, a very dark relationship between Grace and the paramedic and it was told through their points of view and though Macy was a character in it she didn't actually have a point of view Mm -hmm. and what my agent rightly pointed out was though their story was incredibly compelling the reader and the town itself was intriguing Mm -hmm. The reader needed that outsider, and that outsider was Macy, to come in and sort of see the situation through their eyes and guide them through the book, because it is a very insular community with mm-hmm. lots of secrets. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a great technique, that, isn't it? You see it quite a lot, well, in books, but but also in quite a lot of t- film, film and TV as well, the idea of having the outsider, and then you can explain a lot of the stuff, and it's in a natural way, and they're discovering it at the same time as the reader. But funnily enough, I didn't really set out to write, I, you know, there was crime was a major feature, but mm-hmm. I guess it was more of a thriller, a psychological thriller. Mm-hmm. By giving the police officer a sort of, and who carried on through all four books, her voice, I ended up writing a police procedural, which I really never dreamed I'd do. I, and I found that I had a knack for it i did four and um i really enjoyed writing them but it it's not something i original i had to learn on the job in 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 that case yeah well let's go back to the beginning a little bit so tell us a little bit more about your background and how you came to writing in the first place because i know you had quite an interesting childhood and you you've you've been you've traveled a lot and obviously you, i think you had a military background as well so tell us a little bit about that Yes, my father was career military in the Air Force, and we did move quite a bit, but it was the Air Force, so a bit more kinder uh, lifestyle than some Navy children I knew, Mm -hmm. which they seemed to be moving every 15 minutes. Um, But we were, my father was stationed in in places as, you know, remote, uh, remote as Iceland, and I actually wasn't along for that. I was back in the United States being born. Um, then there was places like Virginia and Florida, but also Iran, mm-hmm. California, and Alaska. So, um, and the the changes when I moved were quite significant. I moved twice during high school, so um, it has a de- destabilizing effect, but it also probably made me the person who held my hand up first in any situation. I. It's almost like I lost fear very early on in life, um, and I get very excited about change and um, uh, being uh, and feeling a little lost. To tell you the truth, I, I kind of like that feeling of not sure what's going on and trying to figure out a situation. I did end up going to one of the most liberal universities in the United States. I went to UC Santa Cruz, which is on uh, the Monterey Bay mm-hmm. in California. Highly recommended if you're heading out that way. It's an, a beautiful area of the world. So I ended up there and, you know, going to the beach twice a week. Um, you know, somehow I scraped together a, um, a degree in biochemistry and molecular biology. Um, <laughs> yes, but I did do some creative writing courses while, we're there, while I was there, and I loved them. I just felt very strongly, given my family background, that I had to do something serious. Sure. That if I was going to be sent to university and my parents were going to spend this money, I had to take it very seriously. So I did a very serious degree. And um, I worked for a while in labs in Northern California, um, which was interesting. Um, but more and more, I got involved in doing presentations and 
uh, decided I would go into science communication. And so went back to school and did a um, BA in graphic design with the aim of going into science communication. Mm -hmm. I moved to London just after I finished the degree, um, set up a design studio, freelance. Eventually, though, that got to be, it ballooned and ballooned and ballooned. Mm -hmm. And um, I wasn't very happy with it because it was just way too much work Mm -hmm. and not enough money, quite frankly, a bit like writing. (laughs) <laughs> and then yeah. I, <laughs> and then I moved to Milan with my ex-husband, yeah. who was Italian, and I, I, I quit working at that point. And it was the first time I haven't worked since I had my first paper route at twelve. Mm-hmm. I, I have worked straight through, so it was an odd experience. And I had always been. We did a lot of sailing as a family, and we'd have long passages or long car rides going down to Italy or wherever. And I also used to tell my children these elaborate stories. And I started writing them down, typing them. And as the kids got older, my stories grew up with them. Mm -hmm. And it became a bit of an obsession. I was compelled to write. And um, I continued sort of dabbling. And um, when my marriage fell apart, I had a choice. I I was really supposed to go back to school and brush up on my Adobe Photoshop, Illustrator, Quark Express skills, Uh set up my design studio again, go back to work. Um, And then I had a choice. I had this choice. I I was going to go on holiday for the first time by myself. You know, the the kids are going to be with their dad. And I didn't want to feel upset or sad. So I wanted to do something exciting. I didn't want to go off with another family and be the maiden aunt or anything like that. I I wanted to do something new just for me. And I found this creative writing course in Skyros, Greece, Mm -hmm. uh, which uh, I think is vaguely linked to the Arvon Society or something. Yeah. 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 Anyway, so I did a two-week create a writing course and you know you'd get up early in the morning you do your yoga you'd have some breakfast you do three hours of tuition with a published author in this case it was monique roffey she was orange shortlisted for the woman on the green bicycle Mm -hmm. great writer great teacher and at the end of it she said you're really good you you know what are you going to do now are you you know Mm -hmm. well you should go do an ma so i got back to london late august i immediately applied. They had, they had a few occasional places within a few days. I had a place and, um, I canceled my graphic design course and the rest is history. (laughs) I mean, um, I did the two year MA at Birkbeck and by the end of it, I had the beginnings of a novel. I had signed with an agent or the first draft of a novel rather. I'd signed with an agent at Curtis Brown. It was like the dream. And then about a year later, um, I had a book contract. And a year after that, I was a published author. So it was quite quite an amazing feat, really, because it is such a difficult industry to break into. Yeah, so it's quite a circuitous route, but but you kind of got there in the end. So do you remember, you mentioned like a couple of creative writing courses and things when you were um, around college and, and uni and stuff like that, but do you remember sort of enjoying writing from an early age? It sounds like it's something that you're kind of naturally drawn to, or at least talent, you had a natural talent there. I, don't, I think I had a talent for storytelling, mm-hmm. but it was very raw. Mm-hmm. You know, I needed, I needed the the instructors at Birkbeck to to break me right back down again to the basics and build me back up again because I really threw everything at the page when I was starting out I read some I was I've been cleaning out my office Mm -hmm. um, and I had piles of A4 printing you know for some reason I didn't feel like I could get rid of it for years and I was going through it today and reading a few just paragraphs here and there. And I was just like, Oh, face palm. This is, <laughs> this is tragic. This is really bad. Oh my gosh. Everybody Steve. does that though. Don't they? I mean, it's oh, first draft, but it's as well. good. Good to see how far I've come. Yeah. It's you know, a progression. Yeah. I've, it's good to see how far I've come, but it was like, Oh, and I was like, yeah, I can get rid of this. 
<laughs> can go. Yeah, you can finally let it go. I can let it go. I always thought, I thought, oh, there's some gems in here. I'm not going to get rid of this. And I'm like, today I was like, no, no it's, going. it's all going. It's all going. It felt really good, actually. So no more unpublished novels under the desk. They're, they've all gone to recycling. So like usually, you know, a lot of people that I speak to, there's that kind of mantra, that the kind of cliche that gets repeated, which is, you know, nothing is wasted. And that usually people don't want to get rid of anything, but you've made the decision today and you feel good about it. I do feel good. Yeah. I feel lighter. Yeah, that's good. I, I think um, the history of your work can really weigh you down. For example... I've written the four Macy Greeley books in Montana, mm -hmm. and I should explain something to listeners. I, I am in this very strange and unique position, which isn't great for a writer. It's it, because I know with a writer, I think you you have to understand what who you, what your territory is, and my territory for my first four books felt very natural to me. It was rural America. Yeah, but half my life I've lived in London, in Europe, aside from two years in Milan. So it is very much sitting at a desk here and sort of doing long lens fiction. I live here. And um, I felt very strongly that I wanted to write a book here. So I, I wrote those four books. The last one came out in 2017. Yeah. And now I'm, I'm on the last and final edits before it goes out to publishers with a, um, a thriller, a, a psychological thriller, a domestic noir, I think is more what it might be called, um, set here in London, in West London. Mm -hmm. And it has been a, a hugely difficult task. It has, Way right. more difficult than I thought it would be, going from a police procedural to a thriller. It's completely different. Um, you know, with the police procedure, you can have lots of tangents and red herrings where the trajectory of a thriller is, is much more um, linear. In um, a police procedural, you obviously have the viewpoint of a police officer, and um, which kind of, again, you have that outsider guiding the, the reader through the situation. Mm -hmm. Whereas this, I've the 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 point of view is taken away from the police officer mm -hmm. you know they're there on occasion mm -hmm. but they're not this is about extraordinary things happening to ordinary people and mm -hmm. how do they cope with that um so it was and plus the location and the voice and also having written a series of four books, you become, I don't think the complacent is the right word because I don't even think you realize it. No, it's, I think it, you, you've got setting, you've got character, yeah. you've got it's tone, the familiarity style, of it, I should imagine, yeah. all these things. So you, you have reader expectation. Yeah. So you can't, you know, it's, it can feel you've got your character arcs that you have, you've got your storylines that, are set within a book, but then your character arcs move beyond each book. And I think it made me sit up again as a writer and relearn to write again in a way. It's particularly interesting about the location because that was something I was actually going to ask you about. I mean, does it make you homesick when you're writing about it? And and I'm interested the fact that you found it more difficult, aside from the genre issues, from the location point of view, you'd think with you being immersed in that world you live in london you know you'd think that that part of it would maybe be a bit easier than right as you say writing on a long lens as you have been before so why do you think the difficulty was where do you think that came from with the location okay um i can answer that because i i've given it some thought because um with a uh, my first three books because of where they're set especially especially the first one and the second, um, thinking about the third one is, is, isn't, it doesn't apply as much. <laughs> they're, they're towns, but they're so small and insular. It's almost like having an, a tight community, like a locked room murder mystery. Um, and then you've got the landscape sure. around so that the town itself doesn't feel overwhelming, right? London is massive. <laughs> yeah. and it's busy and there's so much going on and you 
as a almost feeling again like a newbie writer, like mm-hmm. an absolute beginner again. I just tried to put through much into the book. I think there was this degree of excitement because I was stepping out and doing something new and it truly invigorated me and I had all these ideas I wanted to explore. Yeah. And um, so my first draft, my agent said to me, and she, they're like, she's like, this is like three different books that you've <laughs> mashed up together. Pick one, you know. Yeah. You've got to simplify. You can't let London overwhelm you. You know, pick an area, keep it small, use it as a backdrop, but don't let it take over. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think it was coming to it with too many ideas because I had the, you know, I couldn't use a lot in the procedurals because it's it, the first four books because of location um, and and tone and style and expectation of readers. So suddenly I could write again, write whatever I wanted. And I think that was the problem. Not that I had lost skills. It's just, I had too many ideas and my edit button seemed to have, uh, stalled. <laughs> well, as you <laughs> say, you're kind of, it's, yeah, it's almost like you're running out into this you know, you've been playing. Maybe it's the, with this with the series to a certain extent. It's almost like you've got this little defined little area, like almost like your back garden that you're kind of mm-hmm. playing. Yes, in, exactly. This little sandbox, and now you've got this huge, you know, enormous the the grounds of some enormous stately home or something that you're out and you can go anywhere and you can do anything. And as you say, it's kind of all made, almost too many options. Yes. So I had to really whittle it down. Um, I do have a tendency to have a lot of characters in my books, even the ones in the first four books and very complicated relationships between characters. Some readers love that. Other readers find it a little bit too much. It's, Mm -hmm. you know, you're not, your books aren't going to appeal to everybody. And if they do, I, I have no idea how you've managed it. Um, (laughs) there's, there's, yeah, I just, who does that it's almost impossible Mm -hmm. so i um you know you write i think of one reader when i write and i just go for it the london book however has been a challenge but i think i've risen to the challenge and i just kept on reworking it and now i have a book that's ticking along nicely fingers crossed everybody says writing is rewriting anyway but i understand from your kind of process rewriting is a really big part of your process because you're not really one for like a really really detailed outline and you'd like to explore and you like to find out where you're going tell us a little bit about that oh yes um i do not plan i wish i did but i don't i have no idea how a book is going to end until i get to the later drafts sometimes in a later draft i might have to rewrite the entire <laughs> midsection of a book right, yeah. and so i'll know the ending already but it's almost like my scaffolding, my planning is writing a few drafts of a book. Mm-hmm. And then and the, and then I have to go back and sort of move stuff around. I've discovered using Scrivener is quite good for me in early drafts me because too, it's easier, yeah. easier to move um, chapters and information around. And you can sort of see overviews of your book quite easily and... Um, much and then later I move it over to Word and mm-hmm. work from there. But yes, I I edit as I go because I can't leave a sentence alone. That's interesting. Um, I I just love playing with sentences and paragraphs. <laughs> you if you read, you rarely will see uh, words that are repeated or sentence structure that is repeated unless I'm trying to emphasize something purposely. True. I. I I read a lot of poetry, so that some, sometimes plays into... Yeah, the economy and the rhythm the, and everything. The, yeah. So I um, I love playing with the written word. Saying that, though, I do end up wasting and throwing away a lot of work. Me, yeah, me too. I mean, it's interesting. That's an interesting mix, though, because I completely understand, as I say, I completely relate to the rewriting thing, and I've just finish the final edit well say the final it's the final edits before submission of a, of a crime novel myself and and i use scrivener. congratulations thank you yeah um and i use scrivener and for the same reason and i found the same thing i did sort of have pretty much i sort of had the ending but not completely but when i was going back especially 
in terms of subplots and things like that i mean i'd had i mean just from the the draft that uh i've just finished i kind of have like a in scrivener i have like a trash folder where i, I don't yes. actually throw anything away but i just drag i do it that out. too I, d- I drag it out and put it in the trash <laughs> and, and i i you know I, I highlighted it the other day and looked at it and it's like over thirty thousand words of stuff that's not in the novel and and it's really not um, an efficient way to do it, but I, I don't Sweetheart, think I can do it anywhere 30, else. <laughs> 30,000 words is nothing. I'm quite sure I, for Bone Dust White, I've probably threw away 150,000. Right. It's only 90,000 words good. long. That makes yeah, me feel good. I, yeah, I, I remember going to the Mac store, uh, the Apple, mm-hmm. at, at the mall for them to take a look because my battery, and they ran some tests on my battery on my laptop and I broke some sort of record for, because they can see how many times it had charged down and charged back up again. Uh-huh. And they're like, we've never seen these kind of numbers before. <laughs> I still have the laptop. I'm going to keep it forever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you have to. Yeah. That's the one bone dust white was written on and I destroyed it in the process. <laughs> but, um, so I don't plan. That's my way of writing. A lot of writers, do the same thing. What I do have a tendency to do that, which worked quite well, especially for the four books in the series, I discovered a pattern over the four books. They're generally about 90,000 words long. And strangely enough, so is my standalone. That seems to be the frame I work in quite naturally. Mm -hmm. But what I have a tendency to do is break up a book into thirds. It's Mm -hmm. like I get the first 30,000 working I get everything established. I got subplots in the main plot. Mm -hmm. I've got character arcs. I've got settings and everything. And then um, it's almost like a wheel that's getting tighter and tighter and spinning and spinning and spinning. And I work that 30, I work that 30. And then you just pop out into the next 30. Uh It's like it has built up so many energy yeah, that it's ready to go. Out so many sort of threads and things as well. Yeah, and you just, and then you do the next 30. Mm-hmm. And it's not so daunting if I break it up into 30. So I get that 30, the, that middle part of the book, making sure it's staying exciting. You know, it's a bit like a souffle, isn't mm. it? And again, I work it and work it and work it. And I got that wheel like tightening and tightening and tightening. And then it's, again, it, it's, you know, type of stasis. It can no longer be maintained. Uh-huh. And then I'm ready to go on to the last 30. And I, I don't know how this happened. I don't know if other writers do the same thing. Mm-hmm. But for me, that seems to be how I can handle 90,000 words. Yeah, because it's a lot to keep in your head, isn't it? I mean, that's the, the, the thing that I find. It's the thing that kind of frustrates me towards... In the within the final stages of the first draft, particularly, you get to that point where you well, I, I don't, I don't, I can't speak for everybody, but for me, it's it's holding it all in my head, you know, the plot things and thinking and th- and almost in some cases forgetting certain things, you know. Oh yeah, I'd no, set that going, yeah. and oh no, I haven't done anything with that, or that's gone off in that direction now, and I need to bring that back. And it's only when you reread it and you think, oh yeah, where was I going with that? That was that was for something I was setting up for later, and now I need to go back to that. Well, I developed something very interesting, and I think it's a handy tool for any writer, and maybe even, especially if you're trying to get a publisher or or an agent or Mm -hmm. something, and your book is quite complex. And I remember going in, my um, my agent is Felicity Blunt with um, Curtis Brown, and and she had she we were like going back and forth, and she was really interesting interested, and I had the final draft and. It changed a lot before it went to the publisher, but, um, and I went in and I do something called a mind map for my books. Oh yeah. Yeah. And it looks a bit like a family tree, but a very warped family. And so you have all the characters and you have sort of, some of them are related. So that looks more like straight lines, Mm -hmm. you know, mother, daughter connections, things like that. Dotted lines for, you know, for Mm -hmm. people are more estranged curved lines, you know, going back, sort of explaining the tension between the characters. And, and then occasionally you would see, I see a character that's out 
on the periphery who's, that's not doing any very much. And I either try to have them do more or eliminate them and whatever role they were were doing i have another character taking it on because i like i said i have a problem with too many characters so it's a good way of seeing everybody on the page and how hard they're working and whether they're worth being there but i found it because my first book i don't know if you've read it is very complex the plot is very complex and the relationships between the people who live in this town are quite complicated Mm -hmm. so i went in with this mind map family tree thing and Felicity's like, oh, my God, I'm going to have all my other this <laughs> Because I could go, yeah. I could point and mm. sort of, and she could understand. She could really see the whole book. Yeah, that's a really good tip, especially, for, I suppose, particularly for that genre, mystery, because it is, as you say, it's essentially, it's a puzzle that you're building there. It's a, it's a big I, jigsaw puzzle that you're putting together. And it, and it helps... Um, because you have to, in just a few concise words, sum up the relationship between characters. So you can immediately see when you're overreaching and things are nonsensical and motivations don't really work. You know, you, oh, poor, you know, this woman did that to that woman, you know, based on just that. No, you have to give them more because that. It's just not enough, you yeah, know. Why you would somebody sort of, do so yeah. horrific? And I suppose if, you if can it's sort of, so thin a reason. Yeah, and I suppose you can see when it's not balanced properly, as you say. You can it, probably see one side of the the storyline or whatever, or the character or whatever it is. Oh, there's lots of stuff there, and there's nothing there. No, I re- I do recommend it. Um, I've never seen it taught in any writing school or anything like mm. that. And I just came up with it. I mean, just to work out the different relationships with my characters. And now I do it with every single one of my books. And then, yeah, and I also make timelines just based on reveals. Right, yeah. Um, so I can get a sense of when information is out. And I have a tendency in the way I used to write is to give as little as possible to the reader and have them fill in the blanks. But that didn't quite work with the procedurals. Um, But then again, I would overstep and have information repeated too many times, um, which isn't a very elegant way of writing. It's it's quite dull for the reader. Mm -hmm. So by looking at how information is revealed, I can see, am I... With important bits, uh, am I, I am I repeating myself too many times or not enough? Um, is the reader really connecting with us? Do they understand what you're trying to tell them? Are you clear enough? Um, and sometimes I think with Scrivener, because the way you can do the index cards and summarize the different mm-hmm. scenes, that's very helpful that you can show what information is revealed in each of the scenes and you can go through and see if you're, if you've uh, been redundant. Mm, Absolutely. And I think it's a really interesting point you make there about when to reveal information and how much information to reveal because, uh, to reveal, because I think that is a new writer mistake. I know I've done similar things in the past when I've written the novel that I've written now is basically in, in first person, but, but the novel that I've written before is in third person and there's kind of multiple perspectives give depending on the, the chapter. And yeah, I do I, the same. Yeah, and I but I often found that I was trying to hide everything from everybody. <laughs> but yeah. the, I'm thinking I was being clever, but the, it actually has the opposite effect because you know, you know yourself when you read it, especially with a say a thriller or something like that. It's often and and I think it with films as well. It's if you give the audience quite a lot of information, but the right information and at the right time, it actually increases the tension because they know something, the reader knows something that someone else in the story might not know. You know, the the hero or the heroine or whatever, and the fact that they know Which it is, and it's coming up and that creates tension, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and again. Some people say, oh, I figured it out before Mm. Macy. Mm. And, well, I said, you know, you have three points of view. Macy has (laughs) one. Exactly, yeah. So, you you know, you probably will figure it out earlier. I mean, that's that's the the downside of doing multiple viewpoints. But what multiple viewpoints does for a book, for me personally, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is I love to look at the same situation from Mm. different perspectives. Yeah especially if those perspectives are unreliable. Some of them are unreliable. Some of them are reliable. 
Yeah. Others don't have quite all the information, but, you know, or, you know, that's Macy's rule, uh, role and she's trying to probe what's really going on yeah. here. So by piecing those three or four perspectives together, you can get the whole story. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it's it's fun as well, isn't it? Um <laughs> I, I like trying to make unsympathetic characters sympathetic and it gets the same thing. It's sort of, well, if you, once you see it from that person's viewpoint, even if you think, well, maybe they are the villain of the piece, but, may, you know, if you see it from their perspective and you're seeing what makes them tick and what their motivation is, then, you know, I think that's good fun as well, trying to do that. Absolutely. I agree. I love playing with character. Right, let's take a quick break there to give a few mentions to some of the listeners who've been in touch over the festive break. Many of you got in touch to say how much you'd enjoyed the recent interview with the worried writer Sarah Painter, with Ava Silurian tweeting that she got lots and lots of stuff out of it, and NC Manda said it was interesting to hear about the motivations and merits of traditional versus indie publishing. NC Manda also shared her own writing goals, the main one being to get her debut novel into the world, and I'm sure she'll be successful, so good Good luck with that. Regular listener Jim Snell got in touch to say he enjoyed Sarah's interview too and to suggest a guest for a future show, which I'd encourage any of you to do. And I'll be looking into that over the next few weeks as well. Uh, Jessica Rufak Hoffman tweeted to say the podcast helped her through Nano and to finish the draft of her book, although the Hamilton soundtrack also has to take some of the credit for that. So thanks, Jessica, and good luck to you with your novel about a Jewish teen conscripted into the Tsar. Jacob Rundle at jrundy08 has begun a Twitter list called hashtag anticipated indie 2019 to help share new indie published books and his own debut comes out very soon too. So apologies if I missed anyone. I can't tell you how much I appreciate all of your comments, help and feedback. So do keep getting in touch via email wayne at waynekellywrites.com dot com or twitter at ju podcast or by joining the facebook community don't forget you can also join the mailing list both on my own site waynekellywrites.com where you can get a couple of free short stories and at uh, joinedupwriting.co.uk where you'll also get a couple of freebies on there so that's definitely worth signing up to um, and if you're looking for another new year's resolution make it to share the show with as many people as possible and to take two minutes to leave me an itunes rating and review it costs you nothing but makes a huge difference to how many people can find the show and if you do that drop me a line or tweet to let me know and i'll be sure to give you a mention in the show right let's get back to my chat with karin salvalaggio where i asked her how her process has changed and developed over time so uh, would you say that your approach has changed from when you wrote that first book to to writing? Obviously, you, you've just come into the end of writing your, your first standalone. So would you say your approach has changed? Have you, has it become any easier? Uh, you know, what what's your favorite pro- part of the process and what's your least favorite part, would you say? My favorite part, and I can honest hand on heart, my five books, the fifth one not published yet, I start with a scene in my head of a character doing something and it doesn't really change from first draft to last draft. Fundamentally, it's the same scene. I wrote the same paragraph. Burnt River, the first paragraph of Burnt River, my second novel, it's almost word for word identical as Mm -hmm. a paragraph I pictured in my head. Um, And then I just go from there and, and then I, I have this scene, it's so strong in my head, and I try to figure out how, where, what is this character doing on this horse? Why are they going up to this lake? Why are they looking into the lake? What are they seeing? Who's, who, why are they worried about this truck that's, in the, you know, that's been uh, dumped there? Why, is, why are they worried that the water level's dropping? What's hidden there that's about to be found? Yeah. Um, so all that has to be worked out. Setting up all these uh, questions and then going and having fun and exploring and answering them. Yeah, it's usually time consuming. Yeah. Um, and sometimes like my second novel came together very quickly. Um, fourth novel as well. Third was a bit of a struggle. Uh-huh. But um, And this last one has been a bit of a struggle, <laughs> even though the first paragraph uh, hasn't really changed that much. Um 
so yeah, I enjoy that process. I really love exploring and trying to figure out the best way through for these characters, but it is a very time consuming way of writing. Um, it's not economical. And I realize <laughs> most writers don't have that kind of patience or time. Um, and I wish I could plot. I don't know. I think, I think it, to be honest, I mean, I speak to, I've sp- spoken to dozens of writers on this podcast and I would say the majority of people that I've spoken to really have usually been uh, pantsers. You know, they usually have just gone for it and they don't outline. That I have spoken to some people that are very, very meticulous um, and they do outline right from the get-go and they spend a long time and, and, and they know every single chapter and every single plot point of the book. But most people ha- have a similar experience to what to what you're talking about. So, I, you know, but I, I, my my view on it anyway is whatever works for you is great, you know. If that's if it works for you and you outline and you want to you want to plot and brilliant go for it if it if it works for you and you just have to go off and do it and i think it's coming to terms with it yourself mm-hmm. um yeah because again i know um you mentioned in a previous interview about self doubt and again i think that's something imposter syndrome <laughs> yeah which i think i think again i think if most people no i'd say 99% of creatives and writers have suffered from it at some point and for most people mm-hmm. it doesn't really go away so um Having, you know, just come into the end of your fifth book, do you feel any different as from, from regards to that? Do you feel more like you've kind of, have you got validation for yourself? Do you feel like you, you know, has that imposter syndrome gone away at all? I feel like in a way this is the big test, if that makes any sense, because I am stepping completely out of my comfort zone as a writer. It's a different voice, a different style, a different location, a a different subgenre, mm-hmm. and I think, uh, in my mind, ooh, how do yeah. I phrase this? Because yeah. I don't want to offend anybody. Because yeah. a lot of people write series, and they're you know twenty books or whatever, and they're amazing, and I, sure. uh, and I really admire it. But I think, in the true sense of the word, writers should be able to step outside of their comfort zone in the characters they know and the location they know mm-hmm. and be able to write a completely different book, like learning another language. Mm-hmm. And I think that just will really, I think I'll call myself a writer once I can do, pull that off, you know, that I can step out of my comfort zone and, and write a, write this particular book. Well, you've written it from the sounds of it. so you know. <laughs> Yeah, but it's at least, <laughs> yeah, let's see what the publishers say, but... Have you got? Um, but, yeah. I don't know how much you can say about it in terms. Have you got? Uh, have you got a title, or do you? Is it? Is it on its way to being published at some stage, or you don't know yet? Well, it's in the last. Um, I hope the last edits with my um, agent. I I did a rewrite based on her notes. And then I'll be going. Out. And um and I sent it off to people like Claire Fuller, who you've yeah interviewed, yeah. and she loved it. She couldn't put it down. She thought she would just sort of spend a you know 20 minutes reading oh, it great. and then yeah. spent her sunday reading it which is a good sign yeah that's great and um she's somebody i admire greatly so that coming from her that was wonderful and uh so we'll we'll go from there at the moment uh, i all struggle with titles mm-hmm. um i really think about them for a long time mm-hmm. saying that though i really love my four titles thus far mm-hmm. at the moment it's called black lion lane mm-hmm that may change <laughs> um, yeah who knows who knows yeah, especially, that may change especially when you get to a publisher because they often make you change it anyway <laughs> or suggest yeah. suggest changes shall we say put it that way oh well, that's brilliant so if people want to find out more about you um karin tell them where they can find you online and um, follow you etc well i mean i have a website um that's just basic information um on my my books karin savalagio.com i I don't get in there and update it very often. I am on Twitter, so I'm always available there um, at Karen Salvala. Just Karen Salvala because yeah. they can't fit, fit Karen Salvalaggio. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just cuts it off after three syllables. <laughs> and um, and then I am an absolute Instagram junkie. So I'm Karen Savalaggio on Instagram. So it's easy to find me there. And then I have a Facebook page, which is somewhat neglected. But Instagram and Twitter are are the most uh, recent information. And I do a lot of writing for um, author interviews, which I love to do. 
uh, for bucanista.com. And if you look me up on their website, you can see all the author interviews I've done over the years. Brilliant. Well, I'll put all those links in the show notes. But for now, good luck with uh, the next project. I look forward to seeing what it's called and uh, and how it goes. And But for now, Karen, thanks for coming on Joined Up Writing. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much. It's been absolutely brilliant. I really appreciate the opportunity. Okay, thanks again to Karin, and you can buy Silent Rain right now in all the usual places. I'll put Karin's links in the show notes over at joinedupwriting.co.uk. That wraps things up for another week, but don't forget you can find the entire back catalogue of interviews on the website. Make sure you subscribe at Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Overcast, or wherever else you get your podcasts from to have the show downloaded automatically every week. Next time, I'll be talking to Merle Nygate about her debut espionage novel, The Righteous Spy. Until then, thanks for listening. I'm Wayne Kelly. Happy writing and reading, and I'll see you next time. Right.